Before we get into the meat of this episode, here's a quick mini theory. You know how in February Paramount announced a merchandising deal for the official Sonic shoes with Puma? And how the movie makes you feel all emotional when Sonic replaces his old worn out shoes with his iconic red pair brought to him by Puma, not so subtly pushing you to buy a pair of new shoes for yourself? Man, wouldn't it be great if advertisers and movies had to, I don't know, disclose that sort of product placement and content targeting younger viewers just like online content creators have to? Huh. Anyway, inequality and governmental regulations aside, sure, this this scene might seem like a shameless bit of product placement, but the reality is that Sonic was actually long overdue for a new pair of pumped up kicks. Most running shoe manufacturers recommend replacing them every 300 to 500 miles, or 483 to 805 kilometers. And according to competitive runners and coaches, it's rare to get more than 1200 miles, or 1930 kilometers, out of a solid pair of shoes before they start to fall apart. Now, I bring that up because in our last episode, we calculated that the blue blur ran 1100 miles in that sprint to the Pacific Ocean and back. That, plus the extra miles that he puts on when fighting Robotnik, means that he is well overdue for a replacement pair by the time that they reach San Francisco. And that's assuming he was starting the road trip with a fresh pair of shoes to begin with. So hey, maybe it wasn't just a shameless plug for shoes, maybe it was just the movie trying to be factually accurate and a shameless plug for shoes. <laughs> Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that, ironically enough, has done more Sonic videos in the last year than our sister channel, Game Theory. Seriously, between doing Sonic videos over here on Film Theory and Marvel Strike Force videos over on Game Theory, it feels like the lines separating these channels are just getting blurrier by the day. So, to say that the Sonic movie was better than expected was an understatement. Sure, it probably won't be winning any awards, or heck, who knows at this point. Maybe it will, considering the number of movies with delays or cancelled release dates at this point, so heck, it could win some awards just by default. Oscar Best Picture winner for 2020, Sonic the Hedgehog. Anyway, with it coming out for an early digital release this week, I wanted to talk about it one last time, because maybe it was just me, but didn't you think it was weird the way that Sonic shoes had holes in them? Not them having holes, obviously, that's perfectly normal. No, what struck me as odd was where the holes were in the shoes. I don't know about you, but every time I've ever worn through a pair of shoes, it's always been in the heel. And yet a huge plot point in the Sonic movie is that he has holes in the toes of his shoes. I mean, that's the thing that allows Dr. Robotnik to scan Sonic's footprint and discover that he's dealing with some alien creature. So, is Sonic running wrong? I mean, far be it for me to lecture the blue blur on how he ought to be running. He's out there running over a thousand times the speed of sound, meanwhile I'm here huffing and puffing after more than a light jog. He clearly doesn't need to take any running tips from me, but seriously, is Sonic going about this whole running thing all wrong? What is going on here? And what insights does this information give us about Sonic's overall running technique. Could the fastest thing alive actually be faster if he chose to run in a more efficient way? For any other character, we could probably start by looking at his running animation and not have to resort to this kind of observation to get a feel for how they run, but Sonic moves so fast that a 24 frames per second movie ain't gonna be enough for us to capture his full run cycle. I mean, depending on what frame you're looking at here, it looks like Sonic's either heel striking or forefoot striking. Let me explain what I mean by that. In the world of running, there are several schools of thought about the proper way to run. When you run, you can either forefoot strike, landing with the front of your foot hitting the ground first, or you can heel strike, landing with your heel hitting the ground first. The fact that Sonic shoes are completely worn through in the toe is highly indicative of the forefoot striking or toe running approach. And you see, that's interesting, because that's actually not the method favored by elite competitive runners. Runners who compete to win in marathons mostly prefer the heel striking method. One of the main reasons for that is that running shoes have a heel that is specific specifically designed for that sort of approach. For instance, take a look at the Nike Vaporfly shoe. You see immediately that the heel part is much thicker, and when resting flat, the toe doesn't even touch the ground. You'd be running with a pretty awkward gait if you tried to land toe first on these sorts of shoes. Looking at that clip again, notice how the runner's heel actually extends out at first, as if it's about to hit the ground, before the runner pulls back and strikes heel first. Simply put, elite runners heel strike because that's what the best running shoes are currently designed for. These kinds of running shoes improve a runner's speed by packing the heel with foam that gives the heel a bit of a bounce, allowing the runner to rebound off the ground better. It's the exact same idea behind the Air Jordans that literally have an air pocket in the heel. Much like an inflated basketball will bounce better than a flat one, a running shoe heel made of the right materials will give a runner better bounce than if they were running with a flat shoe. Lately, the idea of having air pockets or foam padding in the heels of shoes has gone to extreme levels. Those Nike 
Vaporfly shoes that I showed you are built with a special Zoom X extra thick foam cushioning, which, according to Nike's calculations, makes runners 4% more efficient. Now, 4% might not seem like that big of a deal, but if you're an elite competitor trying to set a world record, that sort of extra efficiency might be enough to shave seconds, or heck, even minutes off of a marathon record time. And you know what? That's exactly what it's managed to do. In fact, that 4% has caused the Vaporfly shoes to dominate the competitive running world. In May of 2017, Olympic runner Elliot Kipchoge ran a marathon using the Vaporfly shoes and set a record of 2 hours, 1 minute, and 39 seconds, beating the previous world record by a whopping 1 minute and 18 seconds. That might not sound like all that much, but when you're talking about marathon running times, that is a huge difference from the previous record. In 2019, though, he broke the record again, this time running the marathon in under 2 hours. His time, 159.40. And real quick, can we actually take a moment to recognize how impressive a real live human being running a 26.22 mile marathon in 2 hours is? I mean, that is the equivalent of running a mile in 4 minutes and 34 seconds, and then keeping that pace up for an entire 2 hours. Most of us can't even run a single mile, or heck, even a single lap at that sort of pace. I mean, I know there's that old saying, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but it almost feels like these people are just straight up sprinting non-stop for two hours. It's the sort of performance that would make our buddy Sonic proud. But again, he did it wearing those Vaporfly shoes, which has led the entire sports world to ask, is it the shoes? That sounds like it's a joke or a line from an old Nike commercial and well, is it the shoes? It's gotta be the shoes. It is a line from an old Nike commercial, but it's also a very real question that's happening in the sports world right now, which has caused the Vaporfly line and the world record marathon time that Elliot Kipchoge set while wearing them to become the center of controversy. According to sports science journalist Alex Hutchinson on Vox's Recode podcast, which, if you haven't listened to, is actually really fascinating. The five fastest men's marathons in history have all been run in the last 13 months, all by runners wearing vapor flies. They don't act soon. It's going to be too late because the world records are going to keep dropping and then, then they're going to be in a situation where if they try and restrict it, it's like, oh, well, then all the times in the last five years or whatever have been run on quote unquote illegal shoes. Maybe Nike's fears of this sort of controversy are exactly the reason that when they first started testing the Vaporfly prototype out in real competitions back in 2016, they actually disguised them to look like other types of running shoes. No joke, they were undercover shoes for the first year of their existence. Again, from Alex Hutchinson during that same podcast. Once Nike had these prototypes and they were pretty sure that they worked, they started giving out these disguised prototypes that were disguised to look like other shoes. And then at the Olympics in Rio in 2016, the top three finishers in the men's marathon were all wearing these disguised prototypes of a shoe that no one had ever heard of. And the winner of the women's marathon was also wearing a disguised prototype of these shoes. Seriously, how wild is it that people are setting world records with some kind of futuristic Zoom X super foam running shoes that people are talking about banning the shoe for being too good and that the shoe company is actually having to disguise the shoe prototypes to secretly sneak them into competitions. The point of all of this is that yes, the shoes do matter and what the shoes are built for is heel striking to give yourself that little bit of extra bounce with each step. If Sonic is forefoot striking or toe running like we see him do, he seems to be giving up a huge advantage. So does that mean that Sonic is actually running incorrectly? Well, not necessarily. You see, all of this comes from the world of competitive running, where people are trying to shave a few seconds off their world record time and that 4% of extra efficiency matters. But there are some runners who espouse a completely different viewpoint. The idea that forefoot striking is actually a better, healthier, and more natural way to run. It's a big part of what drives the push towards barefoot running that's gained so much momentum over the last couple years. People who either choose to run completely barefoot or run in shoes with flat soles and no padded heels specifically designed to simulate a barefoot running feel. A study in the Journal of Applied Physiology examined the force exerted by people running barefoot on a treadmill and found that, when landing on their toes, a graph of the force experienced by the runner's body was a smooth curve. But when heel striking, there was this big spike in the force curve. That spike is not only an unexpected jolt to your body each and every time that you land, a potential cause for injury, but it also interrupts the natural smoothness of the runner. The bounce of the heel striking the ground and the force of the runner pushing off the ground happen at slightly different times, throwing off the actual running motion of the body. For a human runner, odds are they're not going to notice the difference. But given Sonic's incredible levels of acceleration, he's exerting a lot more force than a normal human runner would. Just some quick back of the napkin calculations 
calculations here, but reusing some of our numbers from the previous episode, during Sonic's run to the Pacific Ocean, he accelerates at a rate of 491.7 meters per second squared. And if we go with his canonical weight of 35 kilograms, or 77 pounds, that means that he's exerting 17,209 newtons of force. That's 3,869 pounds of force, which is 53.2 times his own body weight. Compare that to the fact that human runners push off the ground with a force that peaks at about 2.5 times their body weight. Sonic's legs are pushing with more than 20 times more force than a typical runner. And considering that fact, it makes it obvious why Sonic would rather run on his toes and rely on the power of his own legs instead of striking with his heels and feeling that extra bit of jolt every single time his foot lands. So is Sonic running incorrectly? Well, for as weird as the toe holes seem to me, no. It appears that Sonic is running in the easiest, most natural, organic way that a two-legged humanoid can run. Nike, you may not like the fact that I'm broadcasting this message out to the world, but this is the ideal running form. At least if you're a Mobian who's capable of pushing the ground with over 3,800 pounds of force every time you take a step. As far as us humans, though, keep bouncing off your foam pads, my friends. Or don't, since, you know, you're supposed to be indoors right now, so just watch the Sonic movie again, hashtag with me. Because what else is there to do at this point? Play Doom Eternal, I suppose? Anyway, that's just a theory. A game theory. Nope, it isn't. It's a film theory. Thanks for watching. Also, can I just say how weird it is that the toes of his shoes wore away, but they show the heel of his sock, and that one just so happens to be worn away. I just think it means that socks need to be stronger all around.